Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time it is a review of the 1987 horror anthology sequel, Creepshow 2. Now, this is the uh, out-of-print, limited edition, Arrow Video uh, collector's edition of the film that was sent to me by a good friend of mine and a longtime subscriber, Jonathan. And uh, I'm really glad he went out of his way to send this to me because the prices for this now are ridiculous and that's really too bad because now and even the uh, the regular edition i think is out of print because some rights issue uh with lakeshore entertainment so now the best version of this film is not widely available for people who want to maybe see the film for the first time or for people who have seen the movie but want to upgrade uh, to a Blu-ray. And that's really too bad because the original Anchor Bay Blu-ray is fine, but this transfer is a 2K restoration and it's the best the film has ever looked. And it has all these extra features like interviews with some of the cast and crew as well as the uh, legacy features from the earlier anchor bay release plus it's got this really i mean this hard case which is honestly really gorgeous looking um and uh then it also of course you have the regular look regular blu-ray that it comes with and it has a booklet in it so you get a booklet with some writing on the film in it and then this limited edition also comes with a uh, comic adaptation of Pinfall, the story that never got adapted in any form uh, that was uh, written but never really got into a shooting phase or anything like that. So that's really cool that it, this comes with a, an exclusive comic adaptation of Pinfall. And I, I've read the comic, and it honestly would have been cool to have seen that uh, in the film. Originally, this film was supposed to have five stories, just like uh, the first creep show, but budget constraints uh, ended up having two stories cut out. Uh, one of the stories was The Cat from Hell, which would go on to be adapted in Tales from the Dark Side of the movie. And then there was Pinfall, which was uh, the other story that never really got adapted uh, in any uh, Romero horror production or of an anthology, uh, unlike uh, Tales from the Dark Side of the movie. Now, Creepshow 2, it came out in 1987, and it was released through New, New World Pictures. So this is one of the... Uh, uh, Laurel Entertainment also produced it, but I think New World was responsible for the theatrical release. This is at a time when New World was still financially somewhat stable because, of course, they would release Hellraiser and they do a few other releases. Uh, New World is one of those companies that really came and went. They made a little bit of a bang with their horror franchises and their horror titles, and in just a span of a couple years, just went completely bankrupt. Uh, I think New World Pictures themselves would make a really interesting topic for a documentary. I think it would be really interesting to hear from people who worked at New World and all of that, just to see what happened, how they started out, how, how, how they are a company that released stuff like Creepshow 2 that made $14 million in 1987 and... and released the first Hellraiser film and a few other uh, hits as well as had some decent success with the uh, home video market only to completely vanish from the earth in a span of two to three years. Um, but anyway, it was released in 1987. It was released uh, on May 1st. It had a budget of $3.5 million and it made 14, which adjusted to inflation to today's uh, numbers is a decent amount of money decent profit did not make nearly as much as the first film i think it probably would have done better if romero was involved i don't think romero was uh able to be involved though because he was working on other projects so he was not able to direct or be a part of the sequel so the director of photography for creep show michael gornick took the directing uh reigns for this sequel 
And this is his uh, feature film debut as a director. Before this, he had directed uh, a couple shorts. He did. He directed some episodes of Tales from the Dark Side, and some really solid episodes of the show. But you can tell that Gornick is nowhere near the veteran, nowhere near the same experienced director as Romero. The direction in this is adequate, it's serviceable, but it's nothing particularly spectacular. Uh, there really aren't a lot of scenes in this where the direction really elevates things to another level. Uh, I feel Gornick, honestly, is a better director of photography than he is a director. Um... Case in point, just look at Creepshow. Look at his the, his work in Creepshow versus his work in Creepshow 2. Creepshow 2 feels and looks like a TV movie more more times than not. And I think it's in large parts because that's what Gornick's experience is. I mean, it could be worse. <coughs> Creepshow 3! <laughs> um, but it, it isn't particularly that great either. Now, it features a script by George A. Romero, as well as uh, some uncredited work by Lucille Fletcher. It has some stories that are, once again, based on short stories by Stephen King. I think The Raft is one of them, Old Chief Woodenhead. I, I don't know if that's one or not. I think all three of these actually are. Um, and, yeah, it only has three stories instead of five. It features a score by Les Reed and um, Rick Wakeman. And this is a score that's a mixed bag for me. I don't mind the opening titles. It's nowhere near the same level as uh, John Harrison's work, but it's still pretty solid stuff. I really love the uh, score in the Hitchhiker uh, segment. I think that has some really great guitar work and... and uh, really nice melodies and and it's it's a really it's a standout and easily the best score from the film the the music that's in the raft is pretty good too the old chief woodenhead stuff is a little bit too schmaltzy for me i think the score is a little bit too on the nose when it comes to oh look it's wholesome and uh heartfelt and it just came across as kind of corny um there are other moments where the music cues really do come across as corny um, and they don't really add a whole lot of atmosphere or mood to the sequences, but they're, but for the most part, it's a score that's really grown on me. The more I hear this score, the more I learn to like it. I don't love it. Like I love John Harrison's score for Creepshow, but I still think it's a pretty good score in its own right. Now the film has a prologue, which, uh, has, I, I guess it's Billy, from a creep show or a different kid yeah i guess it's not supposed to be the same boy so it's a completely different boy named billy despite the despite the fact that in the animated sequence he wears almost the exact same kind of clothing but you know we'll see i mean so anyway uh so it, it, it there's like this I guess there's a delivery truck that shows up in a small town in Maine of course you know Stephen King and this kid Billy's really excited and waiting for the next creep show comic uh, this creepy guy uh, which is Don which is Tom, Tom Savini in makeup actually he plays the live action creep in this it's a good makeup job too he gives Billy the latest uh, issue of creep show and then you have the opening titles, which I, they, they are uh, full of comic book panels, just like the first film. It even includes the same font uh, as uh, the first film did when it comes to how it listed off the actors and the cast and crew. That was a nice little touch. Uh, the score isn't nearly as as uh, spectacular as Harrison's, but it, it does the job well. And... Uh, it's a it's a promising start. I would say the ADR on uh, Tom Savini when he's speaking, you could tell that he's dubbed. So it honestly, I don't know. I mean, it, it didn't really come across as that authentic. So you have these inner title sequences, you know, like like the first film did, but they're animated and. I think you have this little bit where you have, like, there's the creep 
and he's animated and he's talking to the camera and he's talking about oh you know uh, you want some horror you know and I, I don't it's voiced by Joe Silver and the voice work is okay but the writing for the creep is terrible it sucks so much like there were more than a few moments where the creep is explaining his jokes like and, and they're really bad puns like I, they're not funny puns like Crypt Keeper would come up with or some of the puns that you saw in the pages that were on the screen in Creep Show. He's like your gluttons for punishment. <laughs> it was like really punishment it's so bad. And then there's another g joke where he literally explains it. He's like, <laughs> get it? <laughs> you never do that. You never explain your puns. I don't remember the Crypt Keeper ever explaining his puns. He said his puns, whether they were lame or not, it didn't matter. He said his puns, laughed, and that was it. He never explained them to you because that's so lame. So, yeah, the Creep, lame. Uh, I don't, I don't really like the animated stuff with the creep. I don't really like his jokes. Joe Silver's voice is okay, but it doesn't really float my boat either. The, uh, animated, uh, what they honestly are is a wraparounds. The animated wraparounds are also lame. The animation is cheap and I get it. That's, that's the best they could do with what they had to work with. But it seems like something from some low rent ripoff of heavy metal. It's got this weird look to it that doesn't really match some of the stuff that's going on with this supposed plot and this wraparound stuff. And you have this kid named Billy who is going to get some Venus flytrap bulbs from the post office. And the voiceover work is pretty bad too, uh, especially by the kid. The, 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 uh, it sounds like an adult doing an impression of what a little kid would sound like. And that's probably exactly what was happening because that's the only... They, that's, <laughs> they didn't have the budget to hire actual voice actors. So they're like, hey, random crew member, can you do a, a vo impression of a kid for me? Oh, that works. Can you do Can you do some voiceover work for Billy? They eat meat! <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it's just... It's such a... It's such a bad lame wraparound it hurts the film just being in there because whenever these sequences show up you, they just make you groan they're so awful and then animation style like i said it's not like some out of heavy metal because you got the bullies like the lead bully that's bullying this kid billy looks like he's on steroids he's supposed to be the same age as billy who looks like he's like what eight or 10 or something but the fucking bully looks like he's a grown-ass man with fucking giant biceps like, <laughs> i don't i don't understand and he keeps and he keeps he really wants billy's ass i want his ass <laughs> what, what is this guy related what is this uh bully related to the cop from tango and cash I want his badge. I want your badge. I want your gun. I want your ass. <laughs> um, who the hell do you think you are? But anyway, um, yeah, I'm not a fan of the animated wraparound segments. I just wanted to get my uh, thoughts uh, out and in order on those before I talk about uh, the stories. So the first story is Old Chief Woodenhead. And this is one that's really a story that the more I watch the film, the more I learn to appreciate this segment. It's still my least favorite segment out of the film, but I no longer uh, dislike it. Because initially, when I first saw this, I didn't care for this segment. I thought it was pretty lame. I thought it was pretty bad, and I, I honestly thought it was a really poorly put together segment. But the more I watch it, the more more I learn to appreciate it. I mean, there's some great lines of dialogue, especially stuff by Sam. One more step and blam! This hair is going to get me paid and laid. Uh, so I, I, I do really enjoy uh, watching uh, Holt McClaney play this just despicable character in Sam Whitemoon. And... Uh, 
I like the I like the heart that this segment has. I think that's something that's really some that's the I think that's the main thing that's really made this segment still resonate with me. The more I watch it, is the heart that this segment has. It's a genuine heart. Uh, the characters uh, Ray and Martha Spruce are an elderly couple, uh, played by George Kennedy and Dorothy Lamore. They're in a small fictional town named Dead River. Uh, the they it used to be a thriving town, but now it lives up to its name, and they're 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 having a hard time making ends meet, and they've helped the people of the town so much, but they haven't gotten much back, and uh, the performances by Lamore and uh, Kennedy I personally feel felt were really good. I thought they were excellent. They really did a, a wonderful job bringing these characters to life. I bought that they were longtime friends and lovers. I bought that. I bought that they were husband and wife. And they had they had great chemistry with one another. And I bought that they were kind souls. And that's what makes the moment when they get gunned down brutally by Sam really heart-wrenching. I would say it's probably the most tragic kill uh, or series of kills that I've seen in this franchise. Because in the other films, like, people earned it or they deserved it. You know, they were being assholes or douchebags or raging bitches. They, they didn't do anything wrong. So that's what makes it all the more horrifying is that this kind elderly couple who didn't we really weren't hurting anybody. We're living up to the the their uh, namesake and their their uh, let's just say um, their their reputation as this really kind and respectful couple that gave so much to their community. When they get gunned down brutally, it's just it's it's hard to watch because of that innocence. That innocence is lost. And none, there isn't any of that in any of the other segments in the series. Probably because you can only handle that in just small doses. I mean, I would say that cl the closest is Jordy Verrill. But he still makes he still makes his own mistakes, but not in the same way. But this is just... I mean, he makes his own bed with the meteor and lies in it. They didn't do anything except, you know, try to protect the tribe's uh, jewelry, their, their uh, sacred treasures, which is collateral for the debt that the tribe has incurred. So it's called Old Chief Woodenhead because George Kennedy, uh, his character, Ray, he has a old cigar store Indian in the front of his uh, general store. And what happens is Sam White Moon shows up with his gang uh where you have fat stuff who's fucking annoying as hell i hated this character played by david holbrook fat stuff gribbons had this really annoying laugh <laughs> it's so fucking annoying and uh you have holt mcclaney who plays uh sam white moon but you also have a uh, don harvey who plays andy cavanaugh who's he calls him rich kid because uh, his parents are rich. Holt McClaney uh, was in uh, a few things. I, honestly, I think he's in Mindhunters, I think. He's in Mindhunter, which is a show that came out in 2017. Um, I will always remember him as Sam White Moon from this segment, Old Chief Woodenhead. Uh, Don Harvey, he was in Die Hard 2. He played one of the uh, henchmen of uh, William Sadler in that film. So there are some recognizable names. Will Sampson is also apparently listed here. I don't, I, who, where, where was he in this movie? Like, is it, was it a blink and you miss a cameo? Was he one of, it says he's one of the white moons, but I don't remember ever seeing him in any, any scene in the film. It must've been a blink and you miss it thing. Cause I, I mean, I, I don't remember seeing, I don't remember seeing Will Sampson in this. I mean, Wikipedia lists him as being in the film, but I don't remember ever seeing him in the movie or in this particular segment. Um, so 
so Sam White Moon ransacks the general store, steals some stuff, and his whole reason why he went there is not only to steal all the money in the, in the register so he can go to Hollywood so he can be an actor, be a movie star, because his hair is going to get me paid and laid. Um, he decides to also steal his tribe's sacred treasures. And George Kennedy, Ray, doesn't want, isn't really going to let them go without a fight. White Moon accidentally kills his, his wife, and then he tries to go after his wife, and he gets shot by White Moon as well, and they both die with shotgun blasts, and there's blood and everything. And then... What happens is the cigar store Indian comes to life and gets revenge and goes after White Moon and his gang. And it sounds silly and dumb, but it's actually uh, handled pretty well. And I thought the effects by, um, I think it was k &B, one of their earliest, uh, yeah, Howard Berger and Greg Nicotero, who uh, worked on this, the... The makeup effects on Old Chief Woodenhead on the Cigar Store Indian that comes to life, I, I thought were quite impressive for a low budget. Uh, and I thought the guy who played uh, Old Chief Woodenhead uh, in the suit, um, Dan Kamen, did a really solid job as uh, the Cigar Store Indian. Puts on his war paint, goes after the gang, um, goes at, finds and takes out fat stuff first with some arrows... He's watching some show, some old public domain movie or something where I think it's like a, what, like a Mexican ripoff of Lassie or something. That's what it sounds like is this guy who's going, loco, loco. And so the fat, fat stuff is some f fat piece of shit who lives in a trailer and is just watching this show and he's eating some chicken nuggets he got out of the fridge. And then he gets, he's in the middle of one, and then he gets arrows that get shot through him. It's a pretty decent effect, but it's a lot of aftermath stuff. That's one thing, that's the one thing that I think holds this segment back the most is that a lot of the kills are aftermath stuff or you don't see anything. I, I think it's because of the sensors for sure, because the sensors were really up in arms and really gunning for films like this at this particular time period. So it comes across as kind of tame at times, even though there is blood. It just, I don't know, like, especially the death of uh, the rich kid. He is about to sneak out of his house because the whole plan is for Sam White Moon and the gang to leave this, this uh, town and go to Hollywood. And he's trying to sneak out. He hears something in the garage, goes to the garage, and then... Sees his firebird all fucked up and busted the pieces. And before he can really register what how that happened, a shadow of Old Chief Woodenhead shows up and then has an axe, hits him, blood splatters on, on, on the white on a white wall in the garage, and then the garage door comes down. Or or, or I guess he doesn't have a shot that shows uh the the rich kid on the hood of the car like all bloodied up and then the door comes down and old chief woodenhead like pauses for the camera and then it's like eh. like, like you didn't really see anything you just saw whoop and blood um and then with sam white moon especially like that was really disappointing he the old chief Woodenhead shows up at his front door. He shoots at it a couple times with a shotgun and tries to escape from a bathroom window. Uh, the cigar store Indian busts through the wall, grabs him by his long hair, pulls his head out and scalps him. But you don't see it. You, and this is a character that's so despicable. He shot ruthlessly killed this elderly couple for absolutely no reason other than a thrill kill, and he just his comeuppance is off screen and really uh, disappointing. Like, 
should be headed his ass or actually seen the scalping not like whoop got hair ah and then his uh, uncle shows up sees the cigar store indian at the front of the uh, general store after he's woken up by what essentially is his i guess his nephew's scream his blood curdling death cry and he sees that the the deline which is uh the uh tribe's treasures are returned to him and then he goes to the general store and and gives his thanks to the cigar store indian and says you know your spirit is at rest you can rest now warrior and then that's the end of the segment and i think that i mean i like it i i don't i don't mind the segment it's a decent segment but it just there's a there, especially when it comes to the gore when it comes to the kills it just feels like it doesn't go all the way and that's disappointing especially when you have a it does such a good job making you hate sam white moon and then unlike someone like upson pratt who gets his just desserts in a delicious way there really isn't any, anything like that for uh holt mcclaney's character sam white moon the of course there's there's other interludes i don't even want to talk about them i already gave my thoughts on those the animated interlude segments the next segment is my favorite segment from the film and one of my favorite horror anthology segments period the raft when i first saw this i was like oh man this is this is shocking this is gory this is intense this is brutal this is suspenseful this is really a lot of fun to watch it has fun characters uh, it's got a simple but effective idea of this group of teenagers who decide to drive 50 miles and go to this lake so they can go on a raft and party and smoke some weed and maybe get some pussy. Um, and there happens to be this mutated oil slick, which is in the lake. And it's essentially a water version of the blob where if you get near the, the sludge, it will ab grab you and absorb you and, and dissolve you and eat you alive. And it's a simple, sec a simple concept and a simple segment, but it's so effective because it's so well done. So you have these four college students, Deke, Laverne, and Randy, and Rachel. They go swimming in a desolate lake far from uh, civilization, which is 50 miles away from uh, where they started. They swim to this wooden raft, and they're terrorized by the floating oil slick. And this is one where the effects by... Uh, Berger and Nicotero are really quite a standout. When you look at their budget, they had 3.5 million, which isn't a whole lot. And they get the most out of it with a segment like this. And and and, and the, the last segment, the hitchhiker. Unlike Old Chief Woodenhead, you get you get the gore here. You get some really memorable kills. And they're really like I said, brutal is a really great way to put it. Like people are screaming and they're like burning and they're like, oh my God, you know, and and then the slime is all over them and you can see like blood already flowing or like their skin starting to slough off. And it, it just, it just looks like a very painful and horrible way to die. And the script I think does a good job making, doing the opposite of what old chief wooden head was intending to do with uh, the uh, with Sam White Moon and his gang. This script for this segment is trying to make these characters likable and charismatic, and making these teens characters that you don't want to see die. And I think with what little it has to offer, and it does a really remarkable job of doing that. Like these are the type of teenagers you love to hang out with. Like Deke's a jock, but he's the fun kind of jock. He's a jock that's kind of a dick at times, but he's got a he's 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 still a good guy. See, unlike some of these other jock characters, he has something about him 
that makes you understand why he has so many friends and understand why he's so popular because he's not a one note like douchebag who just is somewhat for some reason he's just popular because he's on the football team. He's got he's got a personality and he's got a little he's got enough of a heart that you honestly do uh like the guy. You can understand why people want to be around him. And the same goes for his friend Randy and uh Deke's girlfriend, uh, Laverne, Randy's girl that he brought to uh, the uh, party, essentially, uh, Rachel. And Rachel is actually the first one to go, and she's, like, curious, and she helped uh, Randy with uh, ecological trips to uh, clean oil out of the ocean or and stuff like that. And her curiosity ends up killing her. She puts her hand in the oil slick and it grabs her and she gets dragged in it and she's a goner. And so now there's three teenagers left and Deke, of course, after that happens, you know, Rachel got consumed by this blob, you know, he, he, he's like, I'm, I'm going to beat it. I'm fast. I can beat this thing. And he tries to go. He's about ready to go. And then the, the oil slick comes up through the underneath the floorboards of the raft and grabs his leg. And Paul Satterfield's performance here, I thought, not only was he really a likable, charismatic guy in this, it was a good performance by Paul, but I thought he did a great job. Everyone did a great job acting when it comes to, to displaying the the pain that they are in when they are encountering or dealing with this 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 deadly oil slick. It, it, it's another thing that really made you believe it. Despite the fact that in certain shots you can clearly tell it's a trash bag with like stuff on top of it, but it didn't matter because you were sucked in and you bought into things so much. By, and a large part of that is due to the performances. And Deke, it's a, the most painful death. I mean, Laverne is pretty bad too. But his is like the one that like, I would say makes you wince so much. Like it's one of the most painful deaths I can think of that I've seen in a, in a horror film. It's right up there with some of the deaths in the Blob remake. So like when, uh, when uh, I think Paul McCrane's character, he gets his back bent in half and gets pulled through a bookcase. So it's a similar sort of thing where Deke is screaming and it's got his leg and it pulls him through the floorboards. And Deke's a big guy. This is a big guy. He's, uh, he's jacked. He's like over six foot. And he gets bent backwards. Not, not He doesn't really get bent. Well, kind of. He doesn't get bent backwards. He gets, he gets crumpled. He gets absolutely bent in two. His leg bends up and falls down with the rest of his body into the water through the raft and the oil slick eats him. And you see a great shot where you have his fingers through, uh, you see a, a close up shot of his fingers through the floorboards. You see his like senior ring and his hand just slowly slips through the floorboards and the ring is left behind. And that was a great looking shot. So there are moments like this by Gornick that do have great uh, direction. It's just, it's not as consistent as Romero's in, in Creepshow. But yeah, I mean, oh my God. Every time I see this segment, it always makes me wince, but in a good way. So now there are two. Randy and Laverne, uh, of course, they decide to come up with plans to try to uh, avoid the avoid the same fate. So they realize that it comes up through the floorboards. So just stay on the boards. Don't put your feet on the spaces in between the boards. And stay away from the hole in the raft too. Um, I will say this though. If there was a hole that big in the raft, why didn't the, why didn't the oil slick just flow through that and eat them? <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's so to be said about that. I mean, but that's, that's just a little, that's a, just a little nitpick. It doesn't bother me. Uh, that much so they take turns watching they they're cold and so they embrace each other randy was he's he lives up to his name he's a randy guy 
Like he went on to this trip to try to get some, to get laid, and that ends up being his undoing because they, after they fall asleep in each other's arms, he wakes up, he sees that she's still alive, and because he's Randy, he decides he's going to cop a feel. So he sets her down and starts caressing her, pulls her top off, kisses her a little bit on the, on the stomach, and then starts copping a feel on her titties. And then she wakes up, and he stops because he's like, oh my god, you know, I, I don't want to be known as, as, as a Randy rapist. And then she screams this blood-curdling scream. And she's like, Randy! Ah! And then she p turns her face over like this. And the, the slime is all over the side of her face. Because Randy was thinking with his dick and now with his brain. Because he set her down on the uh, space in between the floorboards. In an earlier scene, you already saw that the, the slick was like doing this in between the floorboards. So if you put any part of your body or any part of her body on there she's gonna get eaten and that's exactly what happened so she dies in a really horrible way she's just screaming her lungs off she gets the slime she's trying to get the slime off but then it like comes on her face even more and it's like melting her face and she can't get it off and she gets screak she gets dragged kicking and screaming into into the lake and then you see her skeleton pop up through the water later and then this is a moment where randy decides okay i can beat it i'm gonna do what my friend was not able to do so then he swims for it and he actually reaches the shore but like a dumbass he's like I beat you. I beat you. And then, and then the slick just does a does a new trick and uh, engulfs him from the shore. And that's that's the end in the segment. He deserved it though because it was it was too randy, too randy, too randy for his own good. Um. Initially, I thought that was a problem because I was like, "Come on, like I beat you. What a dumbass." But now I think it works because it's it's a it's a way for him to get his just desserts. It's a way to give him the justified punishment for being too randy, to living up to his name way too much. So yeah, I, I, I love this segment. It is great. It's a phenomenal segment. It's fantastic. It's really entertaining. It does a great job mixing camp horror and just pure entertainment it's just a, and it's a well paced it's got likable charismatic characters it's got great gore it's got a simple but effective concept with the oil slick and the raft it's just and it was i mean the and the like i said the acting by everyone involved is good paul satterfield jeremy green as laverne daniel beer who apparently suffered hypothermia shooting this and actually went to the hospital uh, i think it was worth it in the long run for for him because it was a good performance and a, and a good segment Paige hannah is rachel who actually is apparently daryl hannah's sister so yeah everyone did a did, did a good job here there's a nice uh, call back to uh creep show uh, the, the uh, t-shirt that laverne is wearing says horlex university which is the same university uh that's is listed on the crate in uh, the crate in in the first film. Then we have the last segment, which is the Hitchhiker. The Hitchhiker it stars Lois Chiles, who was Holly Goodhead in Moonraker, and she plays this stuck up, selfish bitch named Annie Lansing, who's cheating on her husband with this. Uh, male gigolo played by uh, David Beecroft and his digital clock radio goes out so now she's running out of time to get to back to her uh, mansion before her husband figures out that she's been doing anything other than being at home waiting for him to come back from work or wherever the heck he comes from 
And there's a there's a speaking of callbacks, just a nice little callback uh, to Stephen King on uh, the top of the uh, I think that's like a headboard or something like that on his bed. You see a copy of Stephen King's It, the book. And then, of course, speaking of uh, callbacks, Stephen King himself actually has a cameo in this as a truck driver for King of the Road Trucking. Um, so this segment involves this selfish bitch who has like seven minutes to get back home before her jig is up. Because she's in such a hurry, she spins out on, I think, uh, on a shoulder uh, of uh, a highway. She's out of control and she hits a guy. She hits a hitchhiker. And because she's a selfish bitch, instead of stopping and seeing if the guy's okay, she sees a truck coming and decides she's going to peel off and she's just going to run. And because this is a creep show segment, she is going to get punished for that. And rightfully so. And her former punishment is the hitchhiker keeps showing up and keeps terrorizing her. In various stages of decomposition and destruction, whether it was caused by her hitting him the first time or hitting him multiple times over throughout the uh, segment. And there's this uh, character, she says lines of dialogue, like she says bastard a bunch of times. She's like, you bastard! Which makes me think, like, is she related to Upson Pratt? Is this like Upson Pratt's sister or something? Like, uh, <laughs> I mean, they're very similar in terms of how selfish they are. Um, but yeah, uh, this segment works because it's got a great score. It's another simple but effective concept. Uh, Lois Chili's uh, uh, performance is great. Uh it's honestly one of my favorite performances by her. She does a really wonderful job playing this role to the hilt. Um, there's even some really witty, nice lines of dialogue. I love the the bits where she's talking about, oh, Mrs. Lansing, it'll cost you. You know, talking about how much money it's going to cost to fix the Mercedes or how much money it's going to cost for a concussion. It has a nice sense of humor to it that I really uh, liked. Uh, great location shots, great stunt work. Uh, huge kudos go to Tom Wright, who played, plays a hitchhiker for doing his own stunts. Uh, good makeup effects uh, by Berger and Nicotero of the hitchhiker as he's getting bashed with the car or shot by Lansing through, like, through the hand or through the head. And this hitchhiker, you know, he just, he just does not give up. You know, thanks for the ride, lady. Thanks for the ride. Um, and she just goes fucking crazy trying to get rid of this hitchhiker. He hitches a ride on the top of her car. She drives through the woods, smacks him around with the trees, knocks him off, runs him over a few times, shoots him with a gun in her glove compartment goes in and rams him head first with the car repeatedly over and over again into a tree until she knocks herself out. And then she thinks like, Oh, it was all a dream. There was no hitchhiker, but then she drives, she, she manages to get her beat up Mercedes back into the, into the garage before. And her husband actually isn't home because he was there dealing with a hit and run driver. Cause he's a humanitarian uh, and speaking of that, the the sequence where the husband stops to uh, see what's going on with, uh, well, not with the hit and run driver. I mean, the hit and run victim. Sorry, my bad. Uh, I guess I was hit by a car. <laughs> I actually was hit by a car. That's why I got this scar. But uh, that's a whole other story. Um, but anyway, so he was dealing with the hit and run victim. And then that's when Stephen King has a cameo. And I, I it's like his character of Jordy Verrill. Like he's and this is like a relative of Jordy's who's who's a uh, driving truck and he stops and he's all like, "What the fuck happened here? What the fuck happened?" 
Um, yeah, I, I I like that. It's it's a fun short cameo, but it, it's it's a fun one. It's it's a good uh, light hearted uh, fun performance by Stephen King. And she manages to get to the mansion, get in the garage. Her husband's not home. She thinks the worst is over. And then the hitchhiker pops up again. He's like in the worst state of decomposition and damage. He's like a smashed up face. Barely, like it's a bar- it's barely even a face at this point. Just a smashed up series of like blood and wounds with a tongue and it's like thanks for the ride lady and he's like licking her and shit it's gross and it strangles her and then her husband finally comes home and then sees her dead in the in the uh in the passenger and not the in the driver's seat with the with the sign that the hitchhiker was holding that said uh dover on it and that's the end of that segment and uh that's essentially the end of the film. I mean, you do have the end of the uh, the interludes where the bullies get eaten by Billy's giant Venus, Venus fly traps. They eat meat! Uh, yeah, eat a dick. <laughs> Shut up. Um, but yeah, uh, there's that. And then, I guess there's another live action bit. There's another thing with the animated creep. Then there's a live action bit with Tom Savini in, in the back of the comic van again, and he's throwing comic books out the out of the back of the truck, and that's the end of the end of Creep Show two. And yeah, um, overall, I do think this is a really solid, good sequel. I think it's a one of the better anthologies out there. Um, other than the animated interlude segments and some aspects of Old Chief Woodenhead that a person to feel could have been done better, there really isn't a whole lot that I found wrong with Creepshow 2. I think overall it's a really good sequel and a really good anthology. Uh, definitely respects the original. It definitely lives up to the original and its premise and all what it's trying to do. I will say this, it doesn't really feel as much like a comic come to life as Creepshow did because it doesn't incorporate the same lighting and the same uh, type of editing and the same frames and framing. I, I think that was just, that's disappointing to me that it didn't have the same kind of lighting as Creepshow did. It didn't have moments where the panels are coming to life with pop art type of cinematography and and with uh, panels where you had like frames within a frame I think that's a missed opportunity I, maybe they weren't able to do that because of the budget maybe that's it but at least the lighting at least there's a couple moments in it that kind of have a little bit of that but for the most part it doesn't really have that comic book look feel to it which I think is another thing that holds it back a little bit for me uh it makes it kind of not feel like creep show because creep show what really makes it so great in a lot of ways is that it is this love letter to the ec comics and it's like an ec comic come to life on the big screen with its cinematography and with its editing and its lighting and and there really isn't a lot of that with this there's the animated inter, uh, interludes which are terrible they're awful. They don't really help it feel like a comic because they don't. The, the, the animation doesn't really match with the type of uh, animation that you would see in an EC comic. The little comic bits that you see look fine, but they they don't ever come to life in any way. And like I said, the the, the lighting and the cinematography at times is kind of flat, and has this TV movie look to it because. It's directed by Michael Gornick, who doesn't really have a whole lot of experience directing feature films. So other than Gornick's lack of experience, uh, some issues I have with the Old Chief Woodenhead segment, uh, the lack of a comic book look or feel to it, a score that is good but not great, everything else about the film is actually quite good, and if not great in its own right. And it's 
unden- undeniably a lot of fun. So it does live up to Creepshow's motto. That'll be the, it's the most fun you'll ever have being scared. This isn't the most fun you'll ever have being scared, but it's close. So anyway, I don't know what else to say about Creepshow 2, uh, except if I were to re- review, I mean, rate it. I've already reviewed it. If I were to rate it out five stars, I would give Creepshow 2 four out of five. Um, really good horror anthology and the last legitimately good or worthwhile sequel in the franchise because Tales from the Dark Side the movie is not considered an official sequel although in a lot of ways it kind of is and I'll get to that more later because whatever flaws this has are nothing compared to the flaws in the next installment anyway uh thanks for watching uh and as always i'll see you later see ya